Hello and welcome back to Quartzlight, your car brochure channel. Today we'll be looking at the Austin Montego. Hello, welcome back. Incidentally, this channel is all about car brochures, so if you're interested in that, please do subscribe. So, the Austin Montego, a car uh, produced by British Leyland in 1984 to 1988, and then by the Rover Group from 1988 to 1995. Didn't really have a mark when it was sold under the Rover Group. It was never rebadged a Rover. It was just a Montego. It was there to replace the very aging Morris Ital and to some degree also the Austin Ambassador to make a much more competitive um, and really to move it into the fleet market against cars such as the Sierra and Cavalier which it did reasonably well. I also think the Montego was the last uh, car to be sold under the Austin um, nameplate. Initially, uh, development goes all the way back to 1977, when it was under the project name LC10. A very slow development, if you think it didn't come out till April 1984. And I guess that was one of the problems, that very slow uh, development time. Really, British Leyland really had to go to the government and say, please, can we have more money? They was really struggling. Um, but the Austin Montego, an unusual design in the end because it was looked at by so many dif different designers. Roy Axe was completely horrified um, by the time he came about and saw it, but it was too late to change the design by then. Uh, later on, the project name was actually changed to LM11. I do believe LM10 was for the Maestro. Initially just coming as a saloon, later on of course there was an estate and of course um, I think it was 1985 there was also the MG Montego Turbo, an extremely underrated car. There was also diesels later on as well um, and they even managed to sell quite a lot of the diesels to the French market and you really knew it was a great diesel if you could sell it to the French market. But enough waffle. This brochure is an early one, 1984, so it's going to show them first models and just the saloons. So let's have a look at that now. Okay, so here is today's brochure, this early Austin Montego one, advertises the car that puts the driver first. Shown here in a metallic blue, a very popular colour, late 70s, but more importantly, early 80s. That was really um, the colour to have. Now, um, I thought something that would be interesting to look at would be this. This looks like a, a reprint, if you will, that was given out at dealerships um, to show how a cut car did. Um, this particular one um, is a reprint from Motor Week um, for May the 19th, 84. Now, it's interesting because it shows how these early 1984 uh, probable fleet cars really compared against each other. So we've got a Montego, a Cavalier and a Sierra, and they put a Toyota Carina 2 in there just because. They did say they considered putting a Talbot Solar in there to see how that competed, but actually said it was would really just show the Talbot's shortcomings against these newer competitors. But like I say, it's interesting for one reason, because we always sort of look down on um, the British motoring industry. The Montego later on, some people thought it was a terrible car. But it's interesting to see how it competed when it was thrown against these other cars uh, before we looked at the shortcomings, when we just purely looked at the car and see how it competed against the real competition at the time. And it's surprising. So we'll have a look at that. Like I say, first of all, it shows the car that it's going to compete against. And it does a little, uh, little test between them. Um, same things like uh, the Sierra and the Montego was the best road holding to. Um, the other two, the Cavalier and the, uh, and the Carina, 
a little bit behind and it shows the interiors how it competes uh, different sort of like ideas of um, how much space you can put in there etc etc so if we look at the back so we look at the sierra it's got a high sill and the monteco's got this cut away in there making it more practical etc etc before we eventually come to the conclusion so we'll just have a quick zoom in on that conclusion and see how this actually was when it came out and how it did compete against um, the Cavalier in particular and, and of course the Sierra incidentally it's kind of like saying about the Sierra if you remember these first Sierras you know it's been replaced now by the Cav the, replacing the uh, Cortina of course a much squarer design it's really saying about the Sierra um, it's a great car if you can overlook its looks because if we remember when it first came out the Sierra um, people really struggled with them sort of curvy lines we don't really think about that now but at the time that was a big thing people really did struggle with the design of the Sierra when it came out but anyway let's just have a quick look at the conclusion and now we'll get to the the brochure proper so this is how it concludes so right back at the start we said that the montego's mission was one of a make or break uh, proportions that austin can't afford for it to be anything less than a winner we acknowledge that the cavalier and sierra the upper medium range market sectors have two of the brightest stars and that to take sales away from them especially in the fleet section would require a car of exceptional all-round ability. If what you have read on the previous pages leaves you in any doubt, let us make it clear, the Montego is that car. Anyone tempted to dismiss it as a maestro with a boot should take a closer look. Of course, the maestro came out um, in 83. It's better than that, and by a significant margin. The secret of the Montego's appeal is not that it dramatically outshines its rivals in any particular department, but that it is equally accomplished or superior to them in all departments. Here is a car which has no basic flaws. It's the most complete package and at a shade over £6,000 is the best value. The cars they were picked were very basic cars, so your 1.6 L's, um, all 1.6's, 1.6 L's were kind of like your, probably what you'd get as a fleet car, so that's why they chose that particular one. It goes on to say, were it not for the rather steep E Max price tag, that's the Sierra that they particularly picked, and the harsh and unsurprisingly poor economy of its engine when driven hard, this Sierra would run the Montego very close indeed for the top spot. As it is, the Ford comes a comfortable second, matching the Montego for handling, ride and build, but falling behind on the performance accommodation stakes. That the Sierra is a roomy car only points to just how good the Montego packaging is. We've said it before, look past the styling and you'll find it's a very fine car in the Sierra. Like I say, a nod to that unusual styling at the time. If the Vauxhall and Toyota suffer in this department, it is not because they are anywhere mediocre, but that the Montego and Sierra are so good. The Cavalier's gradual domination of the fleet market undermines its many strong attributes, among which can be uh, counted smooth yet vigorous performance, good interior space and safe handling, yet it failed to shine in the company and its overall uh, consumption would have given even the most uh, lenient company car accountant pause for thought. For us too, much understeer, spoilt and otherwise well sorted chassis and its interior looked as if it belonged to a car several price categories cheaper. The Cavalier is still a good car, but its showroom appeal needs sharpening. It finally goes on to say the Carina is kind of level pegging with the Cavalier. Although it does say it's probably the easiest car to drive and easiest to live with, and no doubt the most reliable. But anyway, 
It concludes in saying, in this con- confrontation, the Montego has taken on the best and won. Now the fleet buyers must decide. So I hope you don't mind me including that little bit of a fleet test in today's video. It kind of gives you an idea of what the car was like at the time, not what we think about the car years in the future. And I think that's important with any car really. Back to today's video, <laughs> a little bit later than we normally do, but let's open that brochure up now. Inside it starts off with a fabulous um, picture. Um, I'll try and get a little bit of a better shot and zoom out, but it really shows all the range. So what have we got here? Well, this is possibly a very quarter-like vehicle, this top one. That's your very poverty spec model. Your 1.3 or your 1.6, not even an L. Um, we don't even get wheel trims on this. We just kind of like get these center caps. Um, I wonder how many of them are still around today. Your real base model. Next to it, we've got your uh, 1.6 HL or your 2 liter HL spec. And then if we come down, here's your 1.6 L, which would have been the car um, shown or competing in that fleet test. Next to it, we've got a 2 litre HLS, um, an MG, um, the EFI, we haven't got the turbo yet, and your range topping um, Vanden Plaw, or Vanden Plaws, some people say we should say it, but I just say Vanden Plaw because that's how I've always said it. So it then tells us here at the side. Um, those engines. Let's just have a quick zoom in on that. I don't want to make this video too long, but there's some little bit interesting points in this brochure. So it just gives us our engines here. So it's talking about a price leading 1.3, puts economy first with the proven A plus engine. There's a new low weight S series engine in the 1.6, and the top of the range 2 litre HL, 2 litre HLS and Van der Pla are powered by the uprated and refined O-series engine, which also comes in the fuel-injected high-performance form in the MG Montego EFI. The next page shows this sort of cutaway of the uh, uh, Montego, and it's also showing here from drawing board to computer graphics. You know, it seems strange talking about computer graphics have been futuristic but I guess that's what it's trying to say it then on the other page gives us a little bit of an insight in the factory itself like I said I don't want to spend too much time on this brochure now uh, to make this too long but we have a little bit of a look at the engines and then it talks about this fantastic way to get your spur tire out pulling this and pulling it up I think it's a horrendous design that, but let's quickly move on. And then we get to the actual models themselves. And here is that very basic model. Your 1.3 and 1.6, I'm not even an L. Like I say, not even wheel trims on there. A very, very basic model. I wonder how many of those extremely basic Montegos are. We like the average car on this channel, and I particularly like poverty spec models. I don't know why, but I do like that particular model itself. It does give us a little bit of insight into the interior as well. Quite a familiar um, design um, for an Austin model. We then move up the trim range to the 1.6L in that sort of very popular uh, metallic blue at the time the car that we would have been competing in that fleet uh, management report uh, look at the interior with these matching blue seats and of course a five-speed gearbox as we move up the range we get to a, another quite a popular color at the time uh, metallic gold on this 1.6 HL and 2 liter um, HL the 2 litre was apparently a very nice car to drive indeed. Um, again, a matching colour interior this time. Um, what would you call that? Tan? Brown? Light brown? You tell me, I'm not sure what I would even call that. But it certainly matches well 
with the gold. And early 80s, they didn't do this quite often with metallic gold in this particular seat. Were certainly popular choices. As we move up the range still further, we get that 2 litre HLS, a very popular choice at the time. Um, probably wouldn't get that as your fleet car, I wouldn't imagine, but certainly uh, a nice British family car um, with more equipment. And we'll look at the specifications at the end to see um, the equipment. But as you can see, we've got a uh, rev counter now on this particular model. We then move up the range still further and we get to the car we all aspired to own the Vanden Pla with these lovely seats this sort of like walnut um, wood trim um, it doesn't really seem like it was ever meant to be there it's just kind of like doesn't flow with the design at all it's almost like it's just stuck in there but nevertheless you knew you were in your higher spec model with the Vanden Pla and uh, you've got these nice head restraints and of course your all important armrest another thing i really liked about the uh, vanden blah as well um was these nice chrome wing mirrors i think they also later on had a mayfair as well which um, had these sort of nice chrome um, accents like the uh, wing mirrors on there and I think that had wood inside as well but that was later on these are the initial uh, range he's talking about this inheriting a legend the luxury car that puts the driver first keeps going on about putting the driver first and we mustn't forget like he said in that report it was a nice car to drive it was a good handling vehicle for the time and then We'll just zoom in on this one. This is the MG, sorry, zoom out, I should say, the MG Montego. And there we go, the MG Montego EF5. Zoomed in as much as I can, but like I said, it's a full page, so it is a uh, big um, picture. It then, as we turn over the page, gives more details of that. These particularly nice seats with this um, red stitching in. Nice to see the MG badge, I'm sure we all loved seeing that when it came out. Um, MG badge on the steering wheel. I think quite an underrated car overall. Um, not as underrated as the MG um, Montego Turbo. I think that was a hugely underrated car in many terms. Uh, or many ways, I should say. Uh, and then we come to this rather interesting page called the future arrives um, it was a future that was too much really in many ways this new fancy um, dashboard you know you had the voice activation it used to speak to you it was a big thing at the time it was almost like a bit too advanced at the time and caused so many issues um, for Austin at the time or British Leyland they eventually scrapped it but that the higher spec models had this sort of like um and also i think the maestro had this as well this sort of like speaking type dashboard that sounded really interesting it sounded like a fantastic idea but they had so many glitches and problems with it it become a bit of an embarrassment for british leyland so they did scrap it but the earlier models did feature this on the high spec models and i'm sure British Leyland wished they never even bothered with it, but there we go. Um, we'll get on to this nice graphic of the factory fitted options. Let's just zoom in on that, I think. So here we go, the factory fitted options. So you could have metallic paint, um, a slided steel sunroof, we could get standard on a Vanden Plaza. Central locking, we could get standard on a Vanden Plaza as well as the HLS and MGEFI. Um, radio stereo cassettes, standard on the, um, the 1.6L, 1.6 HL, 2 litre HL. Um, and then we've got a, a radio stereo cassette with an electronic tune and four speakers, standard on your HLS and standard on your MGEFI. 
The Van Den Plaas goes one step further and gives you a stereo radio stereo cassette unit with electronic tune and four speakers. So that's that little bit, little bit better. Um, if we scroll down, electric front front windows. Um, electric front windows standard on your HLS Van Den Plaas and MG. Five speed gearbox standard on all of them apart from that very poverty spec 1.3, 1.6. Tinted glass standard on your HL, HLS, Van Den Plaas, MG. As we scroll down the page still further, um, we can also have headlamp wash is an option on all models. That's an that super base one. Um, auto transmission. You can't have that on the base model. Um, in fact, it looks like we can only have that on the 1.6 HL or HL um, or 2 litre HL. Um, but we can only have it on the 1.6 HL, is what I'm trying to say. Uh, your cassette storage system, you can have it on everyone but the base model. Your TD wheels and tyres, everyone but the base one. Your that high tech instrument pack which we should look at standard on your mg efi i guess that was to avoid that one uh, power assisted steering on your two liter hl only standard on your vanden pla and it looks like you have an option for rear seat belts as well Here now it goes on to tell us the specification. I'm not going to go into too much detail because this video would be far too long, but it kind of like gives you the ideas. You can always pause this video later on if you wanted to look at this in any greater detail, of course. But it does show all those different options. And indeed it continues. Quite a lengthy brochure there. It's very detailed indeed, showing all of these different features that you could have. Um, uh, and really, I guess, um, the great thing about the Montego is you could have so many different variations of the Montego to suit yourself, whether it's going to be a, a fleet car or indeed your family vehicle. It then goes on to talk about um, super cover and super sure, useful to break down services. And if we just zoom out on super insurance like the insurance uh, indeed as well for Austin Rover something I kind of like forgot about super cover like I said that's your breakdown cover super sure like I forgot about this one but this is um, an insurance specific for your Austin Rover I guess um, a few little bits of information about the uh, fleet and etc your additional extras that you could get so you could get rather a, a fine um, roof rack there if you wanted, tow bars, um, child seats, you could have this super basic pop-up sunroof which looks horrendous so I wouldn't option for that and mud flaps etc etc and that brings us to the end of this particular brochure. So there we go, the Austin Montego. I'd apologise, this kind of like video has gone on way longer than I wanted it to do but I really wanted to put that fleet uh, report in there as well to show when it was launched it was a very competitive car and I suppose if you're buying one today um, as in a sort of classic car purchase it would be now it's a very elderly car um, you can have to show it still in comparison with other cars how expensive is the Sierra today it would be thousands more if not ten thousand pounds more and it's uh, the Sierra certainly wasn't worth that much more. The Montego was a very competitive car. Thank you so much for watching Quartz Light today. Many more brochures to come. Take care and we'll see you very soon. Goodbye.